This killer's story begins in 1954. Danny Harold Rowling was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, on May the 26th. His 20-year-old mother fell pregnant almost immediately after the couple married, much to his father's disgust. Danny Rowling was the son of a policeman, but he wasn't a very compassionate policeman. In fact, he was a violent and abusive father. For the rest of Danny's life, his father would refer to him as an accident that should never have happened. He had a violent temper, and almost anything young Danny did was able to ignite it. If he didn't breathe properly, he was beaten by his father, that the slightest thing would set him off. And I think if we look at that now, we'd call that coercive control now. We'd call that the kind of behavior that is designed to chip away at somebody's self-esteem that really does destroy someone's identity. Time after time throughout his childhood, Rolling was told by his supremely arrogant father that he was useless. It was a useless piece of work and never would amount to anything. 15 months later, Rowling's mother would fall pregnant again and gave birth to her second son. She would continually try to protect the two boys from their father's destructive influence. His mother flees several times, taking him and his younger brother. They get away from his abusive, domineering father, but she soon goes back to the home. So you've got this constant chewing and throwing, this, this constant state of upheaval, and this creates an environment that isn't safe, that isn't secure. To add to Rowling's insecurity, his mother, his only form of stability, was struggling with mental health issues. Despite him needing her, she wasn't always around. Still a young child, Rowling's existence became a solitary one. He would hide in the woods or wander the neighborhood to escape the constant abuse from his father. He would go out at night when his, his parents didn't know about it, and he would look through the windows of the neighbors' homes and he'd see them around the, the kitchen table, around the dinner table, happy families all together. And he's got that building resentment. Why have these people got this when I haven't? What's wrong with me? And that's something that, that continues to, to bubble away in the background. Rowling yearned for a normal family, the kind of home life that everyone else appeared to have. The suffering at the hands of his father, coupled with his mother's mental instability, sent him on a downward spiral. Now, the impact this had on quite a suggestible child was severe. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that Rolling's father made Rolling into a serial killer, but there was no doubt at all that there was a very great deal of animosity between father and son. As a teenager, Rolling continued to escape his home life. He spent even more time wandering the neighborhood, and around the age of 13, his innocent childhood pastime of watching families became sexually motivated. Rowling had a habit of stalking people, and he would watch them. Um, that voyeurism that had developed during his early years, when he'd look through the windows of, of the happy families in his neighborhood and had that simmering resentment, turned into something else. It turned into something quite sinister. Rowling took a particular interest in watching young women. He was caught several times and began to get a reputation as a peeping Tom. His life had now started on a destructive path of crime. It was that classic serial killer pattern. Petty crime, small offences, gradually escalating into greater and greater offences. By now, he'd started drinking heavily. In 1971, age 16, a drunk Rowling had a fight with his father and he was locked up for two weeks in a juvenile detention centre. Armed with his K-Bar combat knife, once he arrived in Gainesville, Rowling set up a makeshift camp in the woods. He was a, a vagrant, a bum, if you like, but he had a purpose. And his purpose was a very particular kind of victim. Danny primarily targeted uh, young women, and they were always young brunettes like his former wife had been. I was always struck by the fact that, uh, for the most part, his victims were of a type. On the 23rd of August, 1990, new roommates Christina Powell and Sonia Larson were preparing for the beginning of the fall semester at the University of Florida. 
They're 17 and 18 years old. They're freshmen. This is the, the start of an exciting period in their lives. Someone else was enjoying their excitement too. That evening, they caught the attention of Danny Rowling. And he's watching them through the window. He can see them giggling along together, having a nice time, washing the dishes. You can just imagine the kind of conversations they're having about the things they're excited about at university. Rowling has been watching them. In fact, he's probably spent the best part of the night outside in the woods just behind the apartment block. In the early hours, he breaks in. He used very specific equipment, a screwdriver to get in through a sliding door that most of these girls had, and a K-bar knife, which he also used. Those two elements were his signature. Rowling found Christina asleep on the couch downstairs and Sonia in bed upstairs. So he's decided that Christina is the one that he wants. So he gets Sonia out of the way first. He leaves Christina Powell asleep on the couch and creeps upstairs and attacks Sonia Larson while she's asleep. He puts duct tape over her mouth to prevent her screaming and also, of course, to prevent her waking up. Christina, who's asleep downstairs. Rowling stabbed Sonia repeatedly until she was dead. He then made his way back downstairs to Christina, who was still asleep on the couch. He wakes her, puts duct tape over her mouth to prevent her screaming, tapes her hands behind her back, and proceeds to cut off her clothes and underclothes and rape her with a knife to her throat. He then turns her onto her face and stabs her five times in the back. It's an act of the most grotesque wickedness. As with his first female victim, Julie, in Shreveport, Rowling washed and posed his victims. The gun used in the bank robbery had been sold to an individual who had a missing finger, and one of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement agents stood up and says, holy shit and the whole room falls silent. And he proceeds to explain that during the crime scene investigation of the first murders of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson, that they found a piece of paper towel on the counter in the kitchen. On one side was the imprint of a man's penis, as if he were wiping himself off after conducting a sex act. On the other side of the paper was a handprint with a finger missing. And it was at that point that everybody realized the bank robber is the murderer. The problem is we still didn't know who that was. Once that connection had been made, the crime lab began re-examining other exhibits from the Woodland campsite in connection with the student murders. Among the elements of significance were a ski mask whose fibres matched the duct tape found at the third murder, Krista Hoyt's pubic hairs were found on Ronning's sleeping bag at the campsite, blood on a pair of his trousers was found to be Manita Boda's. A screwdriver was found which matched the marks on the sliding doors by which he got into the apartments. But the most significant, perhaps, of all was there was a series of audio tapes. In these disturbing recordings, Rowling alluded to the horror that he was about to unleash. I know I have to run the rest of my life, but I'm getting pretty good at it. I'm a big boy. I take care of myself. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. Well, I'm gonna sign off for a little bit. I got something I gotta do. As more details of the Gainesville killings emerged, police in Shreveport, Louisiana, realized that there were significant similarities between these cases and the unsolved murders of the Grissom family in 1989. They suspected all eight homicides may be connected but the identity of this serial killer remained a mystery. After a period of time when it became evident that the murderer had either left Florida or had been arrested because no further murders 
had been committed that matched that MO, a decision was made to test the DNA of all inmates in Florida who had been arrested between, I think it was like a three or a four month window. Anybody who had been arrested during that time frame was gonna have their DNA checked against the DNA on the, on the homicides. Danny Rowling was in jail pending the trial for the armed robbery of the grocery store in nearby Ocala. So he was on the list to have his DNA checked against the killers. He also had a partially missing finger on his left hand. They obtain his profile and lo and behold, they match and they've got their man. On the 24th of January, 1991, as a result of DNA testing, Rowling became the prime suspect in the Gainesville student murders. Brian Jarvis was a sergeant covering major crimes in Marion County, where Rowling was brought in for questioning in connection with the murders. When Danny walked into the interview room, he was shackled. He had a lot of anxiety. His left leg would tap, it would shuffle. Um, he would be scratching his leg or picking lint off of it. In fact, there was one or two points there where the detective offered to show him the photos of the crime scene. He said, I want to make sure you know what we're talking about here. And Danny couldn't look at him. He turned his head away and he reacted. He said, I don't want to see that. On September the 18th, 1991, Danny Rowling was convicted for three counts of attempted armed robbery and two counts of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. He was jailed for life. Finally, two months later, Rowling was indicted on five counts of first-degree murder for the atrocities in Gainesville. Stephen Greveson was born in Sunderland on the 14th of December, 1970. He grew up in a large family and his parents were reportedly violent towards one another. You are molded by the environment you live in. It's, it's, a, it's a fact, everybody knows this. So if you grow up with violence, you tend to be more violent than people that don't. Greveson appears to show some psychopathic traits in childhood. Some of his old school reports are looked at by a psychologist at his trial. And within these reports, they talk of his lack of empathy, about his callousness, about his real lack of emotion towards other people. I think there are a few red flags in Stephen Greveson's childhood, but they're not necessarily red flags that say to me, this person's going to turn into a murderer. They're red flags that say, this is somebody who perhaps needs some help, needs some support, you know, later on in childhood and, and in their teenage years. Growing up, Greveson was often in trouble. And in 1982, he was arrested for shoplifting. He opened a, a pack of nails inside a, a shop. He didn't take the whole pack. He took one nail, and he got caught. Um, and obviously, the owner of the shop didn't like that very much, and he actually went to court for stealing one nail. <laughs> one nail, not a pack of nails, one nail. But he was only 11 years old. Extraordinarily, he was taken in front of the magistrate. Now, for most 11-year-old boys, that would be the most terrifying experience imaginable. And they would certainly not dream of doing it again, even though it was, in many ways, absolutely irrelevant, tiny crime, certainly not punishable by anything significant. But it's interesting that Greveson didn't take that experience as any kind of lesson. He simply brushed it off, water off a duck's back. He simply went on and did what he wanted to do. At the age of 13, social services made the decision to remove Greveson from the family home. Well, when he was an adolescent, he was taken into the residential care system and he ends up at a children's home in Carlisle. Greveson's troubles continued through his adolescence. In May of the same year, 1990, Sunderland was rocked by the murder of a 14-year-old boy called Simon Martin. He'd been found semi-naked and bludgeoned to death in a derelict building after running away from home just days before. I remember the Simon Martin murder very well. Um, we had five murders in less than a week in Sunderland. And in hindsight, looking back, whether that was putting extra pressure on the police with a given murder inquiry involving 40, 50, police officers, a hell of a lot of police resources, and whether that would have put strain um, on the, the Simon Martin murder at the time. 
The police initially thought they had quickly solved the crime after arresting a local teenager. He was 16, he lived nearby. Um, he was a respectable lad from a good family from memory and he'd been playing in that building uh, with others and they found his fingerprints in the building. Uh, there was blood in the building as well and they found his fingerprint in blood, which was just coincidence. All charges against the 16-year-old boy were eventually dropped. The murder of Simon Martin would remain unsolved for 23 years. But during the original investigation in May 1990, police had also spoken to a local 19-year-old man named Stephen Greveson. He's somebody who had a reputation in the local area for hanging around with, with people younger than him. And I think when you've got somebody who's trying to, to get a sense of control, get a sense of power, you often feel that they hang around with people who they see as slightly inferior to them. Greveson was questioned by the police in the wake of Simon Martin's body being discovered. And Greveson said, yes, I certainly I saw him, but he was fine when I left him. Greveson was released without charge. Three years later, the discovery of the body of 18-year-old Thomas Kelly would trigger a series of similar deaths that would spread fear across the whole of Sunderland. By the winter of 1993, 22-year-old Stephen Greveson had built up a reputation as a troublemaker. In November of the same year, Thomas Kelly, an 18-year-old student, had gone missing from the family home he shared with his parents and his sister, Lindsay. My brother Thomas was just a normal boy for the time, just kind, helpful. He would do anything for anybody. Loved life. We wouldn't go to bed on a night time without saying we loved each other. He used to call me Pins instead of Lind's. <laughs> <laughs> which was a bit strange, but uh, that was the way we went on. We argued quite a bit, as brother and sister do, but never went to bed without making up. We were very close as brother and sister. We were close as a family. We didn't have loads of money or nothing like that, but we, we went out and done things together. Silly things like willy picking and, you know, we just... Very close family, I'd say. Lindsay vividly remembers the day her older brother disappeared. I went to school, my mum went to work, and then Thomas had left for college. And that was the last time we'd seen, seen him. It was actually a bit strange that morning because we were very close as brother and sister. But that morning, he was standing by the fireplace in my mum's house, and um, as we said bye, he walked forward and grabbed my hand and squeezed my hand. On November the 26th, 1993, the emergency services were called to a burning shed on an allotment near Monkweermouth Hospital in Sunderland. The fire attracts attention inevitably and the body of Thomas Kelly is found. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for whoever arrived on that allotment to confront the sight of a, a burning body in a burning building. It is gruesome. When I came on the news, I wasn't listening to the news, and I'd, I was sitting in the house, and I'd seen my dad cover his face, and I went, what's wrong? And he went, there's a body being found. And they say parents get a feeling. I don't know where they go feeling at that point. Thomas's badly burned body had seemingly destroyed any possible evidence, and senior detectives at Northumbria Police were not convinced that he had been murdered. Detective Wilson was certain that all three deaths were linked. Not only were the crime scenes extremely similar, all three boys had attended the same school, Monk Wearmouth Comprehensive. In August 1994, Wilson asked for a second post-mortem to be carried out on all the bodies by a senior pathologist. 
you don't just <laughs> call a friend and say, oh, can you re-examine the body? No, you have to get, you know, court orders and judges and everybody involved. And this detective was relentless. He went after it and he got the court order that was needed. This is a detective that he knew that something was wrong. You know, when you read a case and, and you just, you, maybe it's a gut feeling or there's something there, you go, okay, this cannot be like this. On closer inspection, all three teenagers appeared to have died in the same way. So in Graveson's case, the most important factor was that the ligature marks are then identified. We're now moving from three similar but apparently discrete incidents, albeit involving three young boys from the same school, to three potential homicides from the same school the same way. Now you're almost looking towards a serial killer. I think that the fact that Stephen Greveson killed his victims via strangulation is very significant because it's one of the most personal forms of killing. You are watching the life drain out of them. He's probably feeling more in control at the time he's killing his victims than he's ever felt at any point in his life before. So I think it's a very deliberate choice of method. I think they were groomed, encouraged, cajoled, or perhaps even threatened by Greveson and they paid the price with their lives. I remember the day very well. I was on The Sun when um, Northumbria Police uh, revealed that they were treating the deaths as murder. Um, and tragic as it was, the family would have seen that as a victory, um, that finally something was happening. Detectives had found fingerprints and a footprint belonging to Greveson in the derelict house where David Hansen was murdered. They were from a burglary Greveson had committed months before, but proved he had access to the property. And by September 1994, Wilson had retrieved some conclusive evidence. Seaman found in the stomach of the third victim, 15-year-old David Grief, was a DNA match for Stephen Greveson. If you burn the outside of the body, then you can lose injuries. If you lose the skin and the soft tissues beneath it, there's going to be less and less that you can see. But it can be surprising what you can still identify, particularly if the area is protected from the fire. You can still see maybe stab wounds. You can see all sorts of things that many people who try to dispose of a body by fire think will be gone. Greveson was already in prison for robbery after holding up a fish and chip shop. Stephen Greveson was a bully. He wasn't nice. He used to go around picking on lads and taking stuff off them. He picked on teenage boys, old women, anybody that was smaller than him, I think. He was a troublemaker someone to keep away from. When Greveson was arrested for the murder, we weren't shocked at all, because it was what we were fighting for, for months. We knew it was him. We knew that those boys had done nothing wrong. We knew that someone had done that to them. There's somebody who is deliberately targeting men who are upbringing with them. So she was regularly beaten, by her grandfather. There were allegations of incest within the family. Her grandfather had a home-built sauna in his house. And if he wanted to punish her for doing something he didn't like, he'd lock her in the sauna and crank up the heat and just let her stay in there. Eileen's abusive childhood sent her on a downward spiral and fueled her hatred of men. This was somebody who was constantly in fear. Juanos' grandfather allegedly, repeatedly said to her that she was worthless, that she should never have been born, that she was a mistake. So she's learning that she can't trust anyone, that she can't depend upon anybody. And this is very, very dangerous. Eileen learned early to use any means available to survive. Before she got to her teen years, uh, she was known as a cigarette bandit. She would trade sexual favors for packs of cigarettes. It's said that from around age 11, she's using her body as something to trade, as a tool. And this kind of disconnection from her emotions is something that, that is going to have a significant impact on the rest of her life. 
Her behavior left her pregnant, aged 14. Now, on the orders of her grandfather, that baby is adopted. It's taken away from her. And this is just reinforcing those ideas that, that she already has, that those who are supposed to love me hurt me, that I am worthless, that I'm not deserving of love. Shortly after she was forced to give up her child, Eileen was hit by another tragedy. Her grandmother dies of liver failure, having been quite a heavy drinker for many years. Her grandfather actually blames her for her grandmother's death. Her grandfather was furious and threw Warnos out of the house. Aged just 15, Warnos was left homeless. Alone, her only option was to live in the woods at the end of their street. She lives a very feral existence, sleeping in an old car, and she's still a child at this point. And, and this is incredibly damaging. There is absolutely nobody there for her. She is literally just taking each day as it comes. She's making sure that she has enough to eat. Um, she is, is basically using her body as she's used it before. She's learning that life is full of rejection, it's full of pain, it's full of fear, and that she really needs to hurt others before they get the chance to hurt her. One person she was still close to was her brother, Keith. Just 11 months older than Eileen, the rumor was that their relationship was an unnatural one. There were allegations of incest. Um, school friends of Keith said that they'd witnessed these things going on. So she felt a connection, but it was a very pathological and a very toxic one. Unable to cope living outside during the cold winter months in Michigan, age 16, Eileen hitchhiked over a thousand miles west to the warmer climes of Colorado. Two years later, she was arrested for her first offense, driving under the influence and disorderly conduct, which included the dangerous discharge of a 22 caliber weapon. Eventually, in 1976, age 20... She needed a beer, she'd sit on a pool table and kind of demand her, get her another beer or whatever. Having blown her inheritance, Warnos took it upon herself to raise the money the two needed to live. Aileen would go out and prostitute to make money so that she could buy things for Tyria. She would want to take care of her and make sure she was happy and, and never want to leave her. And I think that was what it boiled down to. Daytona Beach, Florida, November the 30th, 1989. 33-year-old Eileen Warnos was now living with lover Tyria Moore and was indulging in a host of petty crimes to maintain their extravagant lifestyle. The frequency of the crimes and the force Warnos used to enact them was increasing. It all came to a head the night she was picked up by 51-year-old Richard Mallory. Richard Mallory owned an electrical repair shop and he'd been divorced for, for many years and he didn't make any secret of the fact that he did enjoy engaging in the services of sex workers. He picked her up hitchhiking, they were drinking, they were hanging out as it were and one thing led to another, uh, some type of violent encounter where she ended up killing him. She shot him four times with a nine shot revolver. She took a couple of pieces of property that belonged to him, a camera and a radar detector, and she pawned them. She made some money off of the deal. When Richard Mallory's body was found two weeks after he was killed, there was no evidence to clarify what sparked her rage. When his body was found, it was, it was very decomposed. Basically, all we have to work with is what we have found at the crime scene, the physical evidence and the trace evidence, etc. We do know that he was shot multiple times and his victim was found in a secluded area right outside the city of Daytona. What triggered Warnos to kill for the first time remains a mystery. But what is certain is that the murder of Richard Mallory was the beginning of a dark and deadly chapter. For her entire life, Wernos has been victimized by men. She's been abused by them. But now she's turned the table. She's the one that's in control and she's very much enjoying it because she's learned from a very early age that violence equals power. And she really is on quite a high at this point. Taking one life once wasn't enough. Six months later, Warnos struck again. There's usually a, what they call a brief cooling off period. And this absolutely applied here. Large part of it was due to her paranoia. 
and her fear of, of getting caught. And, and when she came back from that brief cooling off period, now she was the predator. She was looking for who she was gonna kill next. She's somebody who's being proactive. She's seeking out victims, she's getting access to them, she has an opportunity to harm them, and she takes that opportunity. These men, they were all white males. They were all traveling the roads alone. They were middle-aged, 40 to 65. On May the 19th, 1990, she was picked up on the I-75 highway by a 43-year-old machine operator, David Spears. When they pulled over and he began to undress, she slipped out of the passenger side door, walked around to the driver's side, aimed and fired. He'd been shot six times. One shot was not enough for Warnos. She was making a point with her killings. She was saying, this is for all the men who have abused me over the years. This was somebody who enjoyed watching men die because for the first time in her life, she was powerful. She was the one in control. She was the one calling the shots. Yeah, I'd love to go out, but I said, you stink. You ain't had a bath. And I don't know when, and I said, I stink. And I said, I ain't doing that. I'll, I'll go get a motel room and we'll clean up, but I ain't going out with no stinking ass woman. Mike told Warnos to wait for him at the bar while he went to get his room key. Instead, he met with a task force outside. And I meet with my outside people and tell them, you know, we make a plan because we knew what she had in mind. The exact words I told them was, piss on the fire and call in the dogs. This hunt's over with. This is her. And I'm not going off with her because I'm not going to be the next victim. Mike returned to the bar with a motel key and showed it to Wernos. He then waited for her to make the next move. Did I get worried about it? No, she wasn't gonna kill me in the bar. I wasn't, you know, I really wasn't worried about it, not at that point. I just went and got another beer and said, just whenever you get ready, I'm ready to go, let's go. A little while later, Warnas and the undercover cop walked out of the bar. The owner of the last resort, Al Bulling, was an eyewitness to what happened next. They were just sitting at the bar drinking, you know. They didn't want to arrest her in the bar or anything because they didn't know what she had or didn't want nobody else getting hurt. So they waited for her to walk out the door. As soon as they hit the door, that's when they arrested her. Wernus was bundled into a car and taken away. The task force had successfully executed the arrest safely. I wasn't worried about my safety because I had the best backup in the world. It was a relief. I think that's the best way to describe it as a relief. The next day, investigators managed to track down Wernos's partner, Tyria Moore, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And they said to her, let's make her a deal. If you can provide evidence, if you can help us convict Eileen Wernos, then we will give you immunity from prosecution. So I think this, this was a very, very tempting offer. Tyria agreed to call Eileen and let the police record their conversations. Lee, listen, they're coming after me. I know they are. No, they're not. What? I'm not going to go to jail or anything. Listen, I have to confess myself. Mm, okay. Yes. Why the hell did you do this? Why did you do this? I don't know. Listen, Ty. Wait. I've never been able to see you. Yes. I love you. If I have to confess everything just to keep you from getting in trouble, I will. Okay. I love you. No. You won't do it now. Get it over with. Right this very moment? Yes. Get it over with. All right. The same month she was arrested, Eileen Warnos fully confessed to the seven murders. 
Well, I came here to see them. I'm honored to be straight up with one thing right there and now. Sure. The reason I'm contesting is there's not another girl. There is no other girl. Okay, so then what you're telling us is you're voluntarily coming forward to talk to us now. Yeah, to let you know that I'm the one that did the charge. Despite the seriousness of her...